All right, we're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, last week we concluded a three-part series on another spirit. <clears throat> that was going to be one message, it turned into three. It wasn't long before that, I preached a three-part series that was supposed to be one message, it turned into three, on another Jesus. So I thought, well, I need to deal with another gospel. And so this morning I'm going to add one more message, not three. We'll see how that goes on another gospel. I, that way we'll have the, a, a series dealing with these vital issues. Um, we've been in this passage in 2 Corinthians 11. I've talked about it, so I'm not going to say much about it. I just want to start there uh, this morning and remind you that deception through counterfeit is one of Satan's main tactics in spiritual warfare. He's too wise to try to and get rid of God's truth. You know, he can't do that uh, so what he does is he works to counterfeit it second corinthians 11 verse 3 paul writes but i fear lest by any means as the serpent that's talking about satan beguiled eve through his subtlety notice the words beguiled and subtlety paul also warns us about the wiles of the devil about the danger of being bewitched and about seducing spirits. That's his major strategy in this age is spiritual deception. And he said, so your minds, and that's the battlefield in spiritual warfare, the minds, what we believe, so your minds should be corrupted. Now that's Satan's goal. He wants to corrupt your thinking by corrupting your doctrine. He said, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In Christ. That's the key. We're complete in Him, Colossians 2.10. But the devil wants you to put your confidence elsewhere, to, to try to perform, to try to make your flesh godly, which is impossible. We're only godly in Christ Jesus, and we need to be focused on Him. Paul said it this way, to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ. The Christian life is Christ. But the devil's working to, to try to distract us from that and get us trusting the wrong things. He said, for if he that cometh preacheth. Now notice, he that cometh. He's talking about preachers coming in at Corinth. He, at, later in the passage, he's going to warn about the, the ministers of Satan. The devil's not omnipresent. He's not showing up in all these different churches. But he's got his ministers doing his work. And they're being led by evil spirits. And there's power behind what they're doing. Satanic power. It's no match for the power of God, but it's very real. He that cometh preacheth another Jesus. Most of the preaching about Jesus today is, is about another Jesus. When you just examine it in light of the Word of God. You only know Jesus Christ through the Word of God. That's where He's revealed. Another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit. Uh, people like talking about, boy, the spirit was moving. But you always got to ask, what spirit are you referring to? There's a counterfeit Holy Spirit out there. That's an evil spirit. Another spirit which you have not received. Or another gospel which ye have not accepted. You might well bear with them. He's saying, why are you putting up with these guys coming in with another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel? You need to listen to me. He said, follow me even as I also follow Christ. And he's, and he's rebuking the Corinthians for listening to the wrong teachers and preachers. Now, of course, the best way to spot a counterfeit is to be very familiar with the real thing. And so when it comes to what we're going to talk about this morning, another gospel, we must be grounded in the truth of the gospel that Paul received by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul's writing to believers here, and we're going to see this morning it's possible for someone who's already saved to hear another gospel and accept it and get confused and lose their assurance and, and their effectiveness in the Lord's work. So gospel preaching is not just for the lost. Obviously, we want the lost to be saved. We need to preach the gospel to them so they can trust Christ and be saved. But believers need to be grounded in the gospel that they believed. The gospel message is simple, 
But once you're saved, you need to get grounded in the depth of what's revealed concerning this message and know it very well. In 1 Corinthians 15, we find the gospel that Paul preached that he received by revelation of Jesus Christ. There are many places we can go in Paul's epistles uh, about you know, the gospel, statements that are made that are very clear concerning this message, but this, this is a passage where he plainly says, this is the gospel. I mean, you can't miss it unless you want to. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Now, before we go any further, I want to say something about this if. This, this bothers people. What do you mean, if? He just said, ye are saved if, and you've got to keep something in memory. Well, I think the reason he says that, if you skip down to verse 12... You've got to understand the context and what's going on here. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. So he, he's going to rebuke them for listening to preachers who are denying bodily resurrection. He say, if there's no bodily resurrection, that means Christ is not raised. If Christ is not raised, your faith is vain. Now, thank God Christ is raised, and if we put your faith in Him, it's not vain. But He's making a point. I will say also, by the way, when He said, unless you believed in vain, Paul writing to a local church, he doesn't just assume that everybody in the church is saved. Only God knows the hearts, and in any local church, you can have people who have an empty profession. They've believed in vain in the sense of not sincerely, not genuinely. What am I talking about? Well, I, I, I think about what it says at the end of John chapter 2, where it says in verse number 23, <clears throat> John 2, 23, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, talking about the Lord Jesus, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now it's superficial. They believed, but it wasn't, it wasn't sincerely and resting in who he really was it was just a very empty profession because notice uh, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any man that any should testify of man and he knew what was in man he knew it wasn't sincere it was superficial it was believing in vain there's a sense in which someone can say they believe in Jesus but in their heart they're not really sincerely trusting in his finished work it's just an empty profession. Do people make empty professions sometimes? Yes, sadly they do. God knows the hearts. But anyway, here it is, verse number 3. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I had delivered unto you first of all. That always needs to be the priority in the ministry. God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. So ministry begins with gospel preaching. Once people get saved, they need to learn the word of God. But when Paul went into an area, it was always, first of all, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. And we're going to see in a little bit that he received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 11, and 12. How that Christ died first. For our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of so on and so forth. He gives all these eyewitnesses, over 500 of them. That He was buried confirms He died. That He was seen confirms He was raised. He, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is according to the Scriptures. Uh, it's according to the Scriptures, but it wasn't fully understood and preached as good news until the Gospel was revealed to Paul. Now, Paul is the first one in the Bible who glories in the cross and preaches it as a message of good news. It was prophesied Christ would suffer. It was prophesied He'd be raised from the dead. But they, that wasn't understood. It wasn't revealed in all what He would accomplish through that until it was revealed to Paul. And by the way, He said according to the Scriptures, not in fulfillment of the Scriptures, because there's nothing in the Old Testament about Jesus Christ dying for our sins, people like you and me. That, now, He would suffer, yes, and that He, 
In Isaiah 53, the context concerns what he's going to do for his people Israel. But what all he did on the cross for the whole world, it was according. According means agreeing and harmonizing with. It's in line with what was prophesied, but it wasn't the complete fulfillment because the mystery of the gospel was revealed to Paul. Paul called it a mystery, a secret. It was made known to him what he'd accomplished. By the way, how that Christ died for our sins. Don't miss that word how. The modern versions take it out. They take out how. That's an important word. How did Christ die for our sins? By shedding His blood on the cross. Can't be saved without the blood of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Well, John MacArthur says you can be saved without the blood of Christ. <laughs> you know, he had a big controversy back in the, I don't know if it was the 80s or 90s, but he got into this some dumb teaching that the blood wasn't necessary. And instead of humbling himself and repenting when he was called out, he doubled down on it. And he said, well, he could have died by drowning and still been our Savior. It's how that Christ died. It was prophesied he would die on the cross in Psalm 22. He couldn't have died just any old way. It had to be the bloodshed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, the Scripture says. And I can show you many verses that prove he had to shed his blood on the cross. It's how that Christ died. And it's not just that he died. He died for our sins. The gospel is that we're sinners worthy of death and hell, but... The good news is Christ died as a payment for our sins. Therefore, we've got to know we're lost sinners in need of a Savior. We put our trust in Christ. And the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection plus nothing. People say, well, we've got to be baptized to be saved. But Paul said at the beginning of this epistle in 1 Corinthians 1.17, Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. And then he defined the gospel as the death, burial, and resurrection. He didn't mention baptism. Why? Because he wasn't sent to baptize but to preach the gospel. And mortar baptism has nothing to do with the gospel, the grace of God. There's only one proper response to the gospel of Christ that God will accept. Only one response. Sinners must simply believe the gospel. And when I say believe, I'm not just talking about giving mental assent to a historical fact. I'm talking about trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which is why Paul said in Ephesians 1.13, in whom you trusted. When you believed, he said you trusted. You are relying exclusively on his shed blood, his death, his burial, and resurrection. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ alone for salvation. You start adding to it. You're perverting the gospel of Christ. In Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth. That's it. You believe. Look at Romans 3, and I'll give you some verses here. The only proper response. So what? look, the, the gospel by which we're saved is the, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again, and the only response that God's going to accept is is my simple faith in what Christ accomplished. If I come to God and say, well, I'm going to get baptized, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to, I'm going to go to the altar, and I'm going to dedicate myself, and I'm going to this, and I'm going to that, I am perverting the gospel. He will not accept any works. It's the, go the gospel of Christ is the finished work of Christ. When you add human works to it, it's no longer the gospel of Christ. Romans 3, 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, saith in the under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law condemns, shows us our our sinfulness and need of salvation, but to be justified, declared righteous, cannot be by the flesh because the flesh is not righteous. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there's no difference. Christ died for all without exception, but you're not saved until you believe the gospel. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He paid it all, whom God set forth to be a propitiation, which means He satisfied the wrath of God on sin, through faith in His blood. How about that one, John MacArthur? 
through faith in His blood. The blood's essential. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Now, in Romans 4, verse 4, To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him. That justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And then again in Romans 11 verse 6, If by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise grace is no more grace. Grace means it's a free gift. Can't work for it. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise work is no more work. Can't mix these things. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5, not 55, that's a typo. <laughs> Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing. And that washing is not water. It's the washing of regeneration. That's spiritual. Renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's the washing the Holy Ghost does when you get saved. Uh, that's not water baptism at all. And so it's not by works. He says it's no more of works. He says it is not of works. He said it's not by works. I was talking to a so-called Church of Christ preacher years ago, and he said, you show me anywhere in the Bible where you're saved by faith alone. So I sat there for the next 30 minutes. Showing him verses like this and his response, I kid you not. Well, James said, James chapter 2, it's you're justified by works and not faith only. I said, well, James wasn't talking to you. He was writing to the 12 tribes. Of course, he couldn't get that. He didn't understand that at all. And that was his problem. And by the way, he, James wasn't talking about a man being justified by works of his flesh. He's talking about faith proving itself by works under that message of the gospel of the kingdom. But he wasn't writing to us in the age of grace. Paul's very clear that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It is faith alone. It's faith alone. It's by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. No works whatsoever i don't care what it is when they add something to the finished work of christ they've perverted the gospel of christ and now it's another gospel so as we're going to see in this message there are false gospels being preached that blatantly require works for salvation you know your roman catholic church your so-called church uh, church of christ says you got to be baptized they, they don't say baptized either they're baptized they love baptized and they just love the water, man. They just love the water. But they, they say you gotta, you, you're not saved without, without that. No, that's works. So there, there are messages out there. It's very obvious they're adding works. But far more subtle is the preaching of a biblical gospel taken out of its dispensational context. Gospel means good news. There's more than one message of good news in the Bible. If a man's preaching to you out of the Bible a message of good news, but it's taken out of context and it's not the gospel revealed to Paul, we got trouble. Okay? That is, and I can, I'm going to show you how subtle that can be. But also, by the way, we're going to hit on this too before we're done, and that is innocent sounding cliches that are not the gospel. Ask Jesus into your heart is not the gospel. Yeah, you know, you got these people. Uh, having these big evangelistic meetings, you know, which, you know, like that guy Greg Laurie, sounds effeminate. You ever heard him out there in California? And he's supposed to be, Billy Graham was his mentor. He has these harvest crusades, and he tries to have these, that guy, his, he is corrupt as you can get when you just do a little research. And they had that Jesus revolution movie. I don't, people ask me what I thought about it. I think it's junk. <laughs> 
He said, have you seen it? No, I don't have to. I just know it is. <laughs> By the, the, the trailer I watched and the little bit I know, that Jesus revolution in the 70s, that, that Christian Woodstock, that there was a bunch of compromise and false doctrine, and the guy leading that thing, Lonnie Frisbee, was a sodomite. Provable. That he, he, would, he would preach and then go be a sodomite the next day. <laughs> and then he would get visions from the Lord on LSD. And yeah, all these Christians, you know, flock into the movies. Watch that slop. Oh, this is great. No, it's terrible. Greg Laurie was interviewing. I saw him interview Alice Cooper, that Satan worshiping nutcase. You ever heard of Alice Cooper? Now he says he, Alice Cooper says he follows Jesus. But they told him, you don't have to quit being Alice Cooper. Use it for God's glory. So he's continuing his satanic music. And you got people like Greg Laurie saying, that's good. That's what you should do. Greg Laurie, I say all that to say, ask Jesus into your heart. That's what he would tell you. That's not even the gospel. That's not the... You say, yeah, it is. Show it to me. I'm going to prove to you it's not the gospel. You, you say, well, it sounds okay. That's the danger, isn't it? On the surface, it might sound innocent, but that's a serious problem right there. So we got we to gotta be... This is more important than brain surgery, okay? <laughs> you better get the gospel right. We can't tamper with it, and a lot of people are tampering with it, and the devil's behind that, whether people realize it or not. He's seeking to, to blind the lost to the gospel, and a lot of preachers are helping them because they're muddying the waters. They're not being clear with the gospel message. Let me show you something in Acts 8, verse 35. Acts 8, verse 35. And this is about the Ethiopian eunuch. I'm sure you're familiar, but let's read a few verses here. Then Paul, oh, excuse me. <laughs> then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. And it wasn't the original autograph, by the way. And it was still given by inspiration, the word of God. It was a copy. And, he's, and so, is, is Philip preaching out of the Old Testament here? Absolutely. He preached unto him Jesus, according to prophecy. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Why would he ask that question? When you, look, he was, he was, the, the eunuch had been reading in Isaiah 53. And in that immediate context, at the end of Isaiah 52, it talks about sprinkling the nations. And it's a reference to Gentiles being baptized in the kingdom age. That's why he brought up baptism, because he was reading about it right there. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now your modern versions take verse 37 out, which is his profession of faith which is a key verse, especially in light of at the beginning of this chapter, you had a false convert whose heart was not right with God named Simon the sorcerer. And in contrast, you have a true convert who believed with all his heart. You take that verse out, you mess up the whole passage. Now, do you, don't, don't answer out loud. Just think about it. Do you think a man can get saved in this age of grace by saying, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Is that enough? What? Be careful. Paul's not even saved yet. Paul got the gospel he preached by revelation. Now, I know some good men <clears throat> who say this is the first, you know, uh, Gentile convert under the gospel of grace. This isn't the gospel of grace of God. The, the eunuch said, I believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Every Catholic priest out there will say that. But if they're trusting in their works... Them saying that don't mean anything. And what I'm saying is this information is not sufficient because you need the preaching of the cross. Okay? This is the profession of faith required to enter the kingdom. Go back to Matthew 16. Matthew 16. You see, on the surface, a lot of people would say, oh, man, that's a great, that's a great passage to use. People need to believe with all their heart, and they believe on Jesus, and then they got to get baptized. There it is. There's the pattern. That's not the pattern. I'll prove it to you, Matthew 16. <clears throat> In Matthew chapter number 16, verse 13, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others uh, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. 
That, see, I can show you verse after verse in the gospel records, that is the required profession to enter in the kingdom. That's what the, the eunuch said, right? Is, but let's read on. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, uh, the, the rock here is not Peter. Catholic Church says the rock is Peter. Well, Peter told you it's not him in 1 Peter 2. <laughs> the rock is Christ. The rock is, Christ, is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's upon that profession, that understanding, that belief that you get in the kingdom church. And the church here is a called out assembly. It's a future kingdom church that was prophesied in Psalm 22. It's not talking about the body of Christ here. The body of Christ is still a mystery in this context. It's not revealed till Paul gets saved much later. But notice what he said. I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, people get confused here because they assume there's only one church in the Bible when it's not the case. Churches are called out assembly. There are different churches found in the scriptures. Gospel means good news. There's different messages of good news found in the scriptures. You've got to look at the context and rightly divide the word of truth. I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. There's the subject right there. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. They had apostolic authority as kings that are going to sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Then charged he his disciples they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ, because now he's headed toward the cross and toward his suffering. The kingdom's not being offered at this point until after he raises, is raised from the dead. It's re-offered to Israel. Verse 21, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes to be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and said, Hallelujah! What a Savior! No, he began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, thou, this shall not be unto thee. It wasn't revealed what the death, burial, and resurrection would accomplish and what it was all about. I'm telling you that the gospel of the kingdom did not include the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And I know that because in Matthew 4, 17, it said from this time Jesus began to preach. And he began to say, repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's not till the end of his ministry he began to show his disciples he's going to suffer, die, and rise from the dead. And when he told them that, they didn't understand it which proves they weren't preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. What is the gospel by which we're saved in this age? We just saw it. It's how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and rose again the third day. And, and by the way, the, you know, the Catholics say, well, Peter's the first pope and all this stuff. Well, well, Jesus looked at the first pope and said, get thee behind me, Satan. The pope still is that too, by the way. <laughs> Satanic nonsense is what it is. Peter was a good man, but he was mixed up here, and it was the devil influencing his thinking. He, and, and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for thou savest not things that be of God, but those that be of men. And then he goes on to show that even though he's going to suffer, the kingdom's still going to be set up because he gives the Mount of Transfiguration to confirm all that. First the sufferings of Christ, then the glory that should follow. But my point I'm trying to make is, I believe Jesus is Christ, Son of the living God. Yeah, but they weren't, even, they weren't trusting at this point in his death, burial, and resurrection. And you can't be saved unless you trust in his death, burial, and resurrection. There are a lot of people, ask Jesus into your heart. I believe he's the Son of God. That doesn't mean you're saved. Not in this age. That's not a sufficient profession. Which, by the way, they had to profess that and then prove their faith and endure to the end. That was the gospel of the kingdom. So by promoting and propagating another gospel, Satan keeps the lost blinded to the gospel of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse 3, If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, that's Satan, he's in religion, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the gospel, of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Satan promotes and propagates another gospel because he wants the lost to be blinded to the gospel of Christ. The way he keeps the lost blinded is flooding, is flooding the market <laughs> with another gospel. But I'm going to tell you this morning, it's believers that already accepted the gospel Paul preached that he warned about the danger of accepting another gospel in 2 Corinthians 11. He's writing to believers. 
Why would Satan want those who are already saved to accept another gospel? To destroy their assurance. So they won't know who they are in Christ, won't know whether or not they're even saved, and how they're going to share the gospel if, they don't, if they're not even grounded in what it is. That's, he'll work on believers about this issue. Now, I know some saved men that I, it, it seemed, I don't know their heart. I'm going to assume they are based on what they've professed, and, and God knows their heart. But I, there have been men that are saved, and they're preaching another gospel. And they don't even realize it. So this is serious stuff. So justification is foundational. That's why Romans is placed first in Paul's epistles. It's foundational. You better get this settled and be grounded in what it means to be justified by faith alone. A false gospel troubles those who believe it. We're going to see in a moment in Galatians 1, they were being troubled by a perverted gospel. But the gospel, the grace of God, brings much assurance to those who rest in it. Paul talked about his gospel came with much assurance, 1 Thessalonians 1.5. If you're troubled by another gospel, you don't even know for sure you're saved, you're, not, you're going to be worthless in the Lord's work. And that's what, the, that's what Satan wants. In the only other passage in which Paul mentions another gospel, he's also talking to professing believers. Let's look at it in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter number 1. Verse 6. Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. So, it, it, he's not surprised by apostasy. Paul knows the danger of that. He's just marveling. In other words, he's amazed it was happening so soon in Galatia. So soon, and they're being removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. And uh, he says, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. The word pervert comes from the Latin per means to and verto means turn. It means to turn from truth and to corrupt. They pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, you know, like Moroni. That's the angel that appeared to Joseph Smith and gave him another gospel. If Joseph Smith knew his Bible and rightly divided the word of truth, he would have known that Moroni is a moron. He's accursed. He's a satanic spirit, not an angel of God. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received. He's writing to people who have received the gospel Paul preached. He's saying, beware. He said, by the way, but though we, Paul's just a man. He's saying, I, if I got mixed up and came along with another gospel than what I already preached to you, you know it's wrong. <laughs> Or even if it's, a, if it's an angel from heaven, it makes no difference. No matter who it is, if they're preaching unto you uh, other than what you've already received, let them be accursed. Accursed means doomed to destruction. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. See, he was persuading men to believe God, and he was seeking to please God. He wasn't a man pleaser. He was a Christ pleaser. And you can't be both at the same time. Now, Paul did write about pleasing men for their edification. That's a different context. But there's a lot of so-called preachers today watering down the gospel to make it acceptable and more palatable to men. And that's a horrible thing to do. But I certify you, brethren, certify is to testify in writing, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. How did he get it then? By revelation of Jesus Christ. 
So Paul's the first one to glory in the cross and preach it as good news. Peter preached the cross in Acts 2, but it was as bad news. He was telling Israel, you killed your Messiah. Repent of that awful deed and he'll return and set up his kingdom. He wasn't saying, good news, Jesus died for your sins. That's not in Acts 2. He said, repent, be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's not the gospel of the grace of God. Paul, I can prove it from the scripture. It's not my opinion. It's a fact. Paul received his gospel by revelation. Nobody preached it before him. And if you think that they, there was someone preaching it before him, then you're calling God a liar and you don't believe what his word says. It's just that simple. The Bible's clear. And so these churches in Galatia were being removed from the gospel that Paul preached, the gospel the grace of God, a message that totally excludes works. And they were being removed unto another gospel includes, that includes works. We saw it in our scripture reading, for example, in Acts 15, verse 1, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, said, except you be circumcised after the man of Moses, you cannot be saved. Circumcision never saved anybody in any dispensation. It was a sign. It was a token of the covenant, but it's not what saved a man. It needed to be done in time past to be in that covenant relationship, but it wasn't a justifying thing. In other words, there are people preaching, saying, well, there, you have these Judaizers telling Gentile converts, well, if you're not circumcised according to the law of Moses, you're not saved. That's another gospel. In Galatians 5, verse 1. Galatians 5, verse 1. See, this is subtle because is circumcision in the Bible? Did God require the Jews to be circumcised? See, these preachers come and say, I got a verse. God said you got to be circumcised. Yeah, but that's not the gospel by which we're saved. You see, there are a lot of preachers that use verses when they preach another gospel. In Galatians 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, and he's the only one who says it by inspiration of God and the Word of God, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. In other words, if you're getting circumcised to be justified and or sanctified, then you're saying Christ doesn't profit. What do you need him for then? I testify again to every man that is circumcised. He's a debtor to do the whole law. If you're going to put yourself under the law, you've got to put yourself all the way under, do all of it all the time, and that ain't going to work. You're going to be cursed by the law. You're not going to be justified. Christ become no effect unto you, whosoever you are, justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Now, there's people in Galatia that made a profession that probably weren't even saved. But there were people that were saved, being removed from the gospel Paul preached, and now they're starting to say, you've got to be circumcised. They are fallen from grace. It's possible for a believer to be fallen from grace. Not out of grace, but from grace. In other words, they're no longer standing fast in the liberty. They've been deceived. A believer can be deceived and can fall into apostasy. Can't lose salvation. 2 Timothy 2 said, If your faith is overthrown, the foundation of God still stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. Because we're saved by grace. We can't lose it once we're saved. But the devil knows he can mess people up that are saved so that they're no longer grounded in the true gospel. And therefore, how are they going to share it with other people? And by the way, people who don't even know if they're saved or not, and they're always doubting it, they're not doing nothing for the Lord anyway. Why? Right? Because, that, I mean, they're confused. They're not going to be serving God. And if they, and if they are, they're going to be uh, hurtful, not helpful, because they may not share the truth clearly. Sinners cannot be saved by the works of their flesh in any dispensation. Because Jesus said in John 6, 63, The flesh profiteth nothing. That's true in every dispensation. He said, the words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. You've got to believe God. See, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith it's impossible to please Him. And you have that faith chapter showing how men had a good report with the Lord before the law and under the law. In all ages it was always what? Faith. Faith. But what is faith? It's believing what God said. Has God given the same message in every age? No, He hasn't. Has God at times required a man to prove his faith by his works? Yes, He has. Mark chapter 16. This is what most of the evangelical world 
calls their marching orders. No wonder why they can't preach the gospel clearly. They think they're under this commission. Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, I believe we ought to get the gospel to every creature, but I, I believe it needs to be the gospel of the grace of God. That's not what he's talking about here. How do I know? I can read the next verse. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's not the gospel of the grace of God. That's the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus told these same men not long before this in Matthew 24, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, then the end shall come. So he's telling them, go into all the world and preach that gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom required water baptism, did it not? And he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, obviously, if they don't believe the message, they're not going to be baptized. But if they do believe it, they're going to prove it by getting baptized. And these signs shall follow them. The gospel of the kingdom requires water baptism. The gospel of the kingdom is accompanied by signs of the kingdom. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover, and so on. Look, that is not the gospel by which we're saved in the age of grace. That's the gospel of the kingdom. And so you have this issue of there are... Look, the gospel of the kingdom required a man to do certain things to prove his faith. It wasn't just believing the death. It wasn't even including the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The gospel of the kingdom wasn't telling sinners, believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you're saved by faith. No. They had to believe he was the Christ, the Son of God, and they had to endure to the end and prove their faith by their works. They had to be baptized in water. And, and they, this is clear in the Scripture. That's why every man out there preaching another gospel has verses to back it up. He's not rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, when Paul said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, James said in James 1.18, Of his own will begat he us by the word of truth. And that word of truth James is talking about was prophesied. James is talking about the gospel of the kingdom, and a man has to be justified by works and not faith only. He has to prove his faith by his works under the gospel of the kingdom. James is writing to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. The first thing you better rightly divide is the different gospels, or you're going to get in a mess. The word of truth by which we're saved is the gospel of the grace of God. But the word of truth to Israel in Acts 2 was the gospel of the kingdom. It was the gospel of the circumcision, but you can't be saved by that. You better rightly divide and see those are different messages. See, when you do that, see what happens is Mark 16 is very clear, right? So you know what a lot of preachers do? They say, that doesn't belong in the text. They say, that's not in the best manuscripts. Yeah, it's missing from corrupt manuscripts, but it's in the, right, it's in the Word of God. It's, it's, it needs to be there. See, if you would rightly divide, you wouldn't have to mess with the Word of God. Acts 2.38 Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's clear as day. What, what did they do with that? They said, well, the Greek means literally that you need to be baptized because you've already received the remission of sin. Well, that's not what it says. No, it, it's clear what it says, and you don't have to mess with the Word of God if you rightly divide and understand Acts 2.38 is not the gospel of your salvation today. So many try to use Galatians 1 to teach there's only one gospel in the whole Bible. Because Paul said, if you preach another gospel, you're accursed. So therefore, there must be one gospel in the Bible. Hey, there's more than one gospel in, the, in Galatians. Look in Galatians 2. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 1. And 14 years after, 14 years after his first trip to Jerusalem after his conversion, he went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation, the Lord told him to do this, and communicated unto them. Now look, communicated means imparted, bestowed, and delivered. He gave them something they didn't have and they needed to know. That gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. If Paul went up to the kingdom church in Jerusalem and publicly declared what he'd been preaching among the Gentiles, it would have caused mass confusion. So he had to do this very carefully because they didn't understand the message. 
But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And Paul takes Titus as an example of a Gentile who is saved without circumcision. And because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me but contrary wise. All right, Peter, James, and John, it was thought that they would be able to add something to Paul and explain something to him. He already knew what they were preaching, but they didn't know what Paul was preaching. Paul said, on the other hand, I added something to them they didn't have. When they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, not to, like the modern versions say, no, of. It, it, this is different messages. It's not just about different audiences. It's different messages. The gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty me to the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision." So when they had the right hands of fellowship, it was an agreement that they had different ministries, not that they were going to have now the same. It's different. Paul said there's a difference between the gospel of the uncircumcision and the gospel of the circumcision. In Galatians 3, verse 8, <clears throat> And the scripture foreseeing, because it's a living book, that God would justify the heathen through faith, preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. What was the gospel preached unto Abraham? In thee shall all nations be blessed. He told you what it was. Is that good news? God didn't say, Abraham, Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross for your sins, be buried and rise again. If you trust in him and him alone, you'll be justified, sanctified. By faith alone? No, he said, and these shall all nations be blessed. That was good news today. There's different gospels in the Bible, friends. In the Bible. People say, oh, there's only one. That mindset is going to mess you up immensely if you continue with it. Gospel simply means good news. There's more than one message of good news in the Bible, but there's only one by which sinners can be saved and put in the body of Christ in the age of grace, and that's the gospel Paul received by revelation of Jesus Christ. I'll prove it to you. If there's not more than one gospel, that means, first of all, the angel that God's going to send to preach to the world in the great tribulation is accursed. In Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour's judgment has come. Worship Him that made heaven, earth, sea, and fountains of waters. The hour of his judgment's come, yet we're living in the day of salvation, the age of grace. That's a different ministry. This angel is sent from God. If there's only one gospel that's to be preached in the whole Bible, then this angel is accursed because that's not the gospel Paul preached, is it? Now, Paul believed all that, but that's not the gospel of the grace of God. But the reason why this angel can come and preach that is because he's not preaching it in this dispensation. Secondly, if there's not more than one gospel in the Bible, that means the apostles were lost during the earthly ministry of Christ. Because Paul said, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Well, guess what? In Luke 18, 31, Jesus took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go to Jerusalem. All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. He shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, spit it on. They shall scourge him, put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things. This saying was what? It was hid from them. They couldn't know it if they wanted to, because it was not revealed yet. Neither knew they the things that were spoken. Paul said, If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. What was Paul's gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It was hid from them. Does that mean they were lost? No, they had believed the gospel of the kingdom. And, and the worst thing of all, when you say there's not more than one gospel in the Bible, you make Christ to be an error. Because in Matthew 24, he said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, then the end shall come. And Paul said in Colossians 1, 6, concerning the gospel, it's come unto you as it is in all the world. 
and bringeth forth fruit, as it does also in you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth. Did the gospel Paul preach go in all the world in the first century? Yet, and here we are in 2023, and the end still hasn't come. But Jesus said when the gospel of the kingdom goes in all the world, the end comes. In the 70th week of Daniel, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world by the 144,000, and the end comes. Different message. So when Paul said another gospel which is not another in Galatians 1, people will say, well, what does that mean? You've got to go to the Greek. In the Greek, the first another is one Greek word, and the second another is another Greek word. You don't need to do that. Just look at the context. The legalists that were troubling the churches in Galatia claimed to preach the gospel of Christ. They weren't claiming to preach another gospel. They were claiming to preach the gospel of Christ, but they perverted it, and therefore they were in reality preaching another gospel than what Paul had preached unto them. In other words, he said, if any man preach any other gospel, another gospel, and then he said, uh, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That they were perverting the gospel of Christ means they claimed to preach the gospel of Christ. They said Jesus is the Christ. But then they added to it, said, but you got to be circumcised or you're not saved. And by the way, the 12 didn't even, the apostles in Jerusalem didn't send those guys down there to do that. Read Galatians 2 and understand that with Acts 15 and all of that. So in other words, they were claiming to preach the gospel of Christ. But Paul said, because they've added works, it's now another gospel. So to add any human works, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it be circumcision, baptism, or whatever, if you add that to the finished work of Christ, you're perverting the gospel of Christ. And those who do that are accursed. Every preacher preaching another gospel is accursed of God. Now, it, there, there are a lot of lost preachers out there. There are a lot of men preaching that are lost. And so they're doomed to destruction. What does that look like? looks like 2 Corinthians 11, verse 15, it's no great thing if his minister, some about Satan's minister, is also be transformed as a minister of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. Their end's going to be bad. It's going to be destruction. They're damned if they don't get saved. Are there saved people preaching another gospel? Sadly, there are, and they're also accursed. But what does that mean? We won't turn to it for time, but mark down 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 17. Because Paul warns that if you don't follow him as the wise master builder in this age of grace, if you're not doing the work of the ministry the way you're supposed to do it as revealed to Paul, your work will be destroyed. Your ministry is doomed to destruction. You're accursed of God. If you're saved and you're preaching another gospel, all your work that you give your life to is going up in smoke at the judgment seat of Christ. And you'll be saved, yet so is by fire. So, again, accursed means doomed to destruction. Destruction is going to be the result. So this is not, this is not playtime. This is serious stuff. So there are false gospels easy to spot because they plainly require works for salvation. But the goal in counterfeiting something is to make it look as close to, as possible to the real thing, right? The closer it is to the truth, the more deceptive and dangerous it is. And yet, you know what I hear Christians say all the time? I've heard people say this, especially the Baptists. What's one of their sayings? They say, well, the Baptists are the closest to the truth. Sorry, that's not good enough for me. Paul said, you need to approve the things that are excellent. What is what's best? Let's be clear. Let's be precise. I don't want to be close to the truth. The most subtle way, now don't let me lose you. You're almost done, but just listen. The most subtle way Satan counterfeits the gospels by disguising works is faith. And he does that with these cliches. Ask Jesus into your heart. On the surface, it sounds good, sounds innocent, but it's exactly what makes it so deceptive and dangerous. In salvation, it's God that invites the sinner to believe the gospel, not the sinner that invites God to do anything. And the idea that people get from this is that they need Jesus to come into their heart to help them be a better person. But in salvation, we're made a new creature. And this cliche is usually used in the context of trying to get sinners to walk the aisle and say the so-called sinner's prayer at the so-called altar. Walking the aisle, the sinner's prayer, and the altar, none of that is in the Word of God. 
as far as evangelism is concerned. That's not in the scripture. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to say a prayer. You don't have to go down to an altar. What do you need to do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what Paul told the jailer. The jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Paul didn't say, ask Jesus in your heart or repeat this prayer with me. No, he said, believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you might pray out of a believing heart when you get saved, but you're not saved by praying. See, the flesh is religious and has no problem repeating a prayer to get a ticket to heaven. But a sinner is not saved without trusting the finished work of Christ alone for salvation. So it's very dangerous to distract people from the issue by emphasizing a sinner's prayer and asking Jesus in their heart. That is dangerous. How about this one? Give your life to the Lord. Would you like to give your life to the Lord? Well, salvation is in receiving the gift of God, not giving a gift to God. See, this is confusing salvation with service. Those who have been saved by grace should willingly offer themselves to serve the Lord. We give our lives to the Lord because we're saved, not to get salvation. Paul said they gave themselves to the Lord in 2 Corinthians 8, 5. He said, present your body a living sacrifice, Romans 12. But that's for the believer. What about this one? If you want to be saved, you must turn from your sins and accept Christ. Well, the implication is that you must clean yourself up before God will accept you. No sinner has the capability of practically turning away from his sins. That's why he needs to be saved. <laughs> Repentance is a heartfelt change of mind. A sinner repents when they believe the gospel because they change their mind about sin and that they want to be saved from it, and they change their mind about what they were trusting in and trust in Christ. That is repentance. But Paul didn't emphasize repentance like John the Baptist and Peter did preaching the gospel of the kingdom to Israel. It's a different message. There's, you don't see Paul telling people that kind of thing. I'll give you one last one. I can go on and on with these. How about make Jesus the Lord of your life? Yeah, people who say that, they like to say this too. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Well, <clears throat> that's known as lordship salvation. And that's, that's another gospel. You see, it's based, where do they get it? They get it mainly in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John on discipleship requirements. First of all, Jesus Christ is the Lord and he doesn't need us to make him Lord. Okay, so that's a dumb thing to say anyway. Uh, he is the Lord. And, and, and the other thing is submitting more and more to the Lordship of Christ in every area of our life is something Christians do and it's something we'll never apprehend in this life. So telling people they have to make Jesus the Lord of their life to be saved is mission impossible. You need to know He's the Lord and He's the Savior and you believe on Him and then as a believer you submit to Him more and more, but they're getting the cart before the horse. I want to finish this morning with these verses. We just need to give the gospel and beseech sinners to be reconciled to God, and we don't need the gimmicks and the tricks and the wisdom of words and rely on all that kind of stuff. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation, everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And he said in 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. See, use the word of God, not your own words, lest the cross of Christ should be made none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And us which are saved is the power of God. Galatians 1.10, do, do I now persuade men or God? If I, do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And then lastly, 1 Thessalonians 2.4, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. When it's all said and done, folks, we need to first and foremost please God. Now, listen, I'm telling you, it's bad. You can't hardly hear a clear gospel message anymore in America. Churches like ours are a small minority. And it is bad. And you got all your big-name preachers, these evangelical leaders, and you got people, you got... And I don't want to start naming names because it's not necessary, but I'm telling you, a lot of the big wigs on the radio and on, you can't hardly ever hear them give a clear gospel message. You go to a funeral and a man gets up. He's a Baptist preacher. He gets up and he can't even preach the gospel straight. It's bad. And what are they doing? 
What are they doing? They're trying to please men. They're trying to make it acceptable to men and they're watering it down and they're compromising and they're using wisdom of words. Just get up and say it's the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. You deserve to die and go to hell, but He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again. You need to trust Him and Him alone. That's just clear gospel preaching, not all this other stuff. Well, if you don't confess Him before men, He won't confess you before the Father. Is that what Jesus said? Yeah, he said that in Matthew 10 about the gospel of the kingdom. That's not the gospel of the grace of God. So we must rightly divide the word of truth to know the gospel of our salvation in this age. And we need to watch out for these subtle counterfeits out there. And be clear and be plain and trust the Holy Spirit to use the pure gospel to save sinners. You know, they need to know they're lost. That's why Romans starts out with condemnation. You need to know you're a lost sinner, knowing that you can't be saved by anything you can do so that they'll be ready to hear the good news of what Christ did through his death, burial, and resurrection. They put their trust in him alone. Our job is to go out and tell people how to be saved. It's not our job to get anybody saved. Just go out and tell them. It's up to them if they're going to believe it or not. But we need to tell them, and we need to invite them, and we need to keep sharing the gospel. I'm telling you that most gospel preaching in America today falls under the category of another gospel. And that's a sad thing. Let's not be guilty of it, okay? May God help us. Let's stand, please.